I got off work early and I thought we could go for a walk by the street. <laughs> oh. Oh. Oh, your, your breath is up. The Wild West, a time of rugged cowboys, fearless pioneers, and the saloon girls. But why did women choose such a filthy profession in that wild era? Here are the secrets behind their daring choices in today's fascinating exploration. Top 20 Filthy Secrets of Wild West Saloon Girls' Intimate Sex Affairs Get ready, because things are about to get scandalous. What's your name, Missy? Dora? Number 20. Their life was uncertain. In the rough and tumble world of the Wild West, the office of a saloon girl could vary greatly. From the rowdy saloon or dance hall to the less glamorous cribs and, for the fortunate few, the lavish parlor houses. Montana's first newspaper publisher, Thomas J. Dimsdale, vividly described a typical hurdy-gurdy house, a large room with a bar at one end and a railing dividing the area where dancing women known as hurdy-girdles entertained patrons. Each dance would cost a hefty one dollar in gold. For some women, the line between dancing and providing sexual services was unclear, especially in the small one- or two-room apartments called cribs. In Los Angeles, these cribs were squalid and offered little more than a makeshift bed and wash basin. However, Lucky was the working girl who secured a job in an actual brothel or parlor house. These establishments, as verified by Legends of America, were elegantly furnished and provided the finest liquor, cigars, and food. Beyond physical affection, they offered card games and other entertainment, all overseen by the astute businesswomen known as madams. The women working in these upscale houses were considered more beautiful and talented than the common saloon girls and were compensated accordingly. One such savvy madam was Denver's Maddie Silks, as highlighted by historian Clark Seacrest. Maddie saw sporting life as a lucrative business opportunity, and she proudly identified herself as a businesswoman. Number 19. Sex Work Was Dubiously Legal In the Old West, the legality of houses of ill repute was a patchwork of local jurisdictions. Some historians assert that the practice of prostitution was widely accepted and madams needed licenses to run their establishments, which often meant substantial revenue for the city. On the other hand, bordellos faced fines, typically around $8 a month, to operate under the radar of local governments. Surprisingly, many authority figures chose to turn a blind eye to these establishments, recognizing the significant economic contribution they made to the local economy. This murky legal landscape allowed the world of saloon girls to thrive in some towns while facing crackdowns in others. Number 18. Many saloon girls sold drinks and nothing more. Contrary to popular belief, not all saloon girls engage in sexual services. In fact, many of these enterprising women made their living by selling drinks rather than providing adult companionship. Patrons at the saloons were charged between 10 and 75 cents for their beverages, and the saloon girls received a percentage of the profits from each drink they sold. By strategically marking up beverage costs, saloon owners could generate profits while also compensating their female employees. The earnings were substantial for the time, with a saloon girl earning around $10 per week, which would be equivalent to nearly $200 in today's currency. Ready to take a break from riding your necks to try one of mine? I've got just the girls for you today. Number 17. Men generally respected saloon girls. In the Old West, society was marked by distinct social stratification, especially concerning women's roles. Proper ladies adhered to societal expectations as wives, mothers, and daughters, often dependent on men for support. However, saloon girls with their non-traditional roles faced disapproval from women adhering to more conventional norms. Despite this societal judgment, saloon girls enjoyed a certain level of respect and desirability among the male population. Their relatively small numbers in the Old West made them sought after by men, who felt at ease in their company due to their low social status. Saloon owners recognized the value of these women and ensured their protection by requiring customers to treat them respectfully. Several serious consequences can result from mistreatment such as being excluded from the establishment, ostracized within the community, or even assault, sometimes even death. 
Number 16. Saloon girls had many different responsibilities. Saloon girls in the Old West were multitasking mavens, taking on various roles and responsibilities that extended beyond providing sexual services. Contrary to the common misconception, these women primarily entertained men through singing, talking, and dancing, using their charm and wit to attract patrons. Their ability to engage with customers on an intellectual and social level set them apart from the shady ladies who were the actual sex workers of the time. Shady ladies were the ones who engaged in prostitution, and they could work for madams in brothels or operate independently. While saloon girls held a certain level of respectability due to their non-sexual entertainment skills, the women in brothels occupied a slightly higher status in society. Unlike saloon girls, women in brothels openly provided adult companionship and worked in businesses that did not hide their true intentions. Number 15. The Smells and Beauty Secrets of the Saloon Girls It was a rugged and wild frontier, but it also lacked some less appealing aspects such as personal hygiene practices. Unlike modern times, bathing, brushing teeth, and washing hair were not daily rituals for the people of that era. Shampoo wasn't even invented until the late 1800s. Women had to make do with plain soap to wash their hair and even then it was often a monthly occurrence. In the absence of modern toiletries, good time girls, saloon girls, and prostitutes had to be resourceful in maintaining cleanliness. Many of them kept basins in their rooms, recognizing the importance of hygiene for both themselves and their customers. However, deodorant and toothpaste were rare luxuries at the time. Toothpaste didn't come in a tube until 1892, and deodorant was not invented until 1888, leaving people to contend with the challenge of stinky armpits and privates. Despite the challenges of personal hygiene, makeup was not entirely unheard of in the Old West. While it was considered taboo among proper women, actresses, saloon girls, and prostitutes were known to use cosmetics. The women used small pots containing carminic acid and aluminum or calcium salts to color their cheeks and lips, and they experimented with hair dye. Here I am where I must be, where I would be, I cannot. Number 14. Perils and Dangers Faced by Saloon Girls It was not an easy life for saloon girls in the Old West, and they often encountered various dangers. While some sought to escape the hardships of farm labor, they soon discovered that their new profession came with its own set of hazards, including violent deaths and sexual assault. Men in the Old West could become possessive and demanding of the saloon girls, leading to potentially dangerous situations. In one distressing account, a saloon girl was beaten by a customer and subjected to a derogatory term, leaving her physically hurt and emotionally wounded. The allure of the saloon often attracted troubled individuals, and saloon girls had to navigate these dangers carefully. As the years passed, many saloon girls found themselves aging out of the profession. With limited options for other employment and a lack of social support, some had nowhere to turn. Tragically, some of these women succumbed to despair and ended their lives through suicide or fell victim to sickness and overdose. Unfortunately, violence against women was all too common in the Old West, and saloon girls were particularly vulnerable. Sexual assault was rampant, and women faced immense challenges in seeking justice due to the lack of laws protecting them. Rape is rarely reported by women, knowing that their attackers are unlikely to be punished. Numerous tales of violence and tragedy further underscore the perilous existence of saloon girls. One such story revolves around Molly Scott, whose life was brutally cut short by a husband's gun. After shooting her, the brute fled the scene, leaving other prostitutes to dress her body for a funeral. Another horrifying account involved Madame Belgian Jenny Boiters, who faced a relentless attack from her ex-boyfriend. Despite being shot multiple times, Jenny somehow survived only to face a chilling execution-style gunshot to her head as the assailant reloaded his gun. Despite the danger, some saloon girls found ways to protect themselves. Jenny Bright, a courageous madam, defended herself and her business when a man with venereal disease attempted to harm her. Jenny produced a revolver and shot him through the heart, ensuring her and her establishment safety. Number 13. Men seriously outnumbered women in the Old West the Old West was undeniably a man's world, particularly during the 1840s and 50s, 
when a surge of settlers headed west in search of gold and better opportunities. The vast majority of these pioneers were unaccompanied bachelors seeking their fortunes in the untamed frontier. While some women did venture to the West as mail-order brides, spouses, or daughters, they were a minority compared to the overwhelming number of men. The gender demographics were strikingly lopsided, with men significantly outnumbering women. In some regions, the ratio reached an astonishing three men for every woman. For instance, in 1850, nearly 90% of the settler population in California was male. This skewed ratio had a profound impact on the social dynamics and daily life in the frontier. What kind of lady are you? She's mine! Number 12. A Look at Saloon Girls' Colorful Nicknames Saloon girls of the Old West were known by a variety of colorful nicknames, each offering a glimpse of the fascinating and sometimes scandalous world they inhabited. These euphemisms often hinted at their line of work and their alluring appearance. Some commonly used nicknames included ceiling experts, soiled doves, and horizontal employees, all alluding to the adult experiences they offered to patrons. The term painted ladies referred to the vibrant makeup they wore, which added to their appearance. Additionally, they were sometimes called ladies of the line or sporting women, highlighting their presence in the lively and vibrant world of saloons. Number 11. The Bold Fashion of Saloon Girls in the Old West in stark contrast to the more conservative Victorian style of the era, saloon girls of the Old West were renowned for their daring and stunning fashion choices. These women, who were expected to be vibrant and entertaining, embraced a wardrobe that was both eye-catching and alluring. In defiance of tradition, saloon girls opted for visible, colorful petticoats that peeked out from under their skirts, adding a playful touch to their ensembles. Their skirts were often brightly hued and featured shorter hemlines, designed to catch the attention of patrons in the rowdy saloons. While some dresses stopped at the knee or shin, others boasted floor-length skirts or even skirts with trains for a touch of elegance. But what truly set their attire apart were the visible garters and stockings, typically considered undergarments in more conservative circles. Number 10. Owner's Fear of Losing Saloon Girls to Customers while the life of a saloon girl in the Old West could offer a relatively comfortable living, it was not always a lifelong career choice. Many young women saw the opportunity to secure their future by marrying one of the bachelors seeking fortune in the frontier, and the frequent interactions with male and the frequent interactions with male patrons provided them ample chances for romance. However, this prospect of love and marriage posed a potential problem for saloon owners. They feared that if a saloon girl fell in love with a customer and decided to leave the establishment, it could result in the loss of a valuable employee. To mitigate this risk, some owners took measures to limit the amount of time a male patron could spend with any particular woman. By restricting the interactions, the owners hoped to prevent emotional attachments from forming between the saloon girls and their customers. By keeping a certain level of distance, the women were less likely to develop deep connections that might tempt them to leave their profession behind for a life outside of the saloon or dance hall. Number 9. Men Often Purchased Drinks for Saloon Girls There was no doubt that saloon girls played an important role in entertaining and engaging the lonely and adventurous men who frequented the bars of the Wild West. As a sign of appreciation or to garner favor, male patrons often attempted to buy drinks for the charming women who kept them company. However, savvy saloon owners had a dilemma to solve. They wanted their employees to remain composed and in control while serving drinks, ensuring that valuable sales were not lost due to excessive drinking. To strike the right balance, a clever solution was devised. When a gentleman offered to buy a drink for a saloon girl, the crafty bar owners discreetly swapped the intended alcoholic beverage with tea or colored water, cleverly disguised to resemble liquor. This clandestine switch allowed the saloon girls to enjoy the camaraderie of drinking with their customers without risking intoxication. The ruse allowed them to maintain their charm, wit, and ability to continue making profits from every sale. I don't know, maybe you should try to talk to Louise. That's a great idea. Yeah? That's the jackpot! Number 8. Saloon Girls in the Old West Had a Risk of Pregnancy in the rough-and-tumble world of the Old West, saloon girls faced numerous challenges, but perhaps one of the most dreaded was an unwanted pregnancy. 
For these women, pregnancy meant being unable to work and navigating a dangerous path to deal with their predicament. One historical account from an archaeological dig of a brothel revealed an alarming practice. The use of syringes to inject hazardous substances like mercury, arsenic, and vinegar into the body, attempting to induce abortions or treat diseases. Some establishments even had connections to doctors who prescribed medicines for similar purposes. However, the most significant obstacle these women faced was the oppressive Comstock Act of 1873, which not only prohibited birth control items and information, but also banned abortions. As a result, saloon girls had to resort to their own ingenuity to avoid unwanted pregnancies, concocting homemade remedies and methods. The actual number of infants born to saloon girls during that era remains unknown, as terminations were seldom reported due to the fear of legal repercussions under the Comstock Act. When pregnancies ended in stillborns or fetuses, these unfortunate losses were often discreetly disposed of or buried without any official record. A poignant example from Laramie, Wyoming illustrates the hardships these women endured. In 1877, Mary Keene and Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Wicks faced charges for failing to provide a proper burial for a fetus, likely belonging to Mary. Such incidents highlighted the difficult and stigmatized reality faced by women in the Old West when dealing with pregnancies. While some women managed to raise their children, stepping away from the prostitution realm, they often did so in secrecy. Laura Evans of Colorado exemplifies this, as her daughter Lucille remained tightly lipped about her mother's profession, describing her simply as a landlady. Number 7. Dancehall Girls Were Paid to Dance with Men With the promise of lively music and the chance to dance with alluring dancehall girls, dance halls introduced a new form of entertainment to the Old West. These women were paid to be dance partners, adding a touch of excitement and companionship for the lonely men of the era. For the price of a dollar, patrons could purchase a ticket that entitled them to dances with the women employed by the dance hall. The dancers, in turn, earned money from each ticket sold and also received a percentage of the profits from the drinks they sold to their dance partners after each dance. This system allowed the dance hall girls to earn a substantial income, especially if they were particularly popular and in high demand. Some of these sought-after dancers could make more money in a single night than many men earned in an entire month sometimes engaging in as many as 50 dances per night. Number 6. Sex work could take place in brothels or on the street. Sex work in the Old West took on two distinct forms, the regulated world of brothels and parlor houses and the riskier territory of street-based work. Contrary to popular belief, sex work was a recognized and legitimate source of income, especially in the unincorporated territories where proper governance was lacking. Around 25% of the population is believed to have participated in sex work, with many women finding employment in brothels or parlor houses. These establishments advertised their services with hanging red lanterns and offered additional attractions like game rooms and dancing to entertain potential clients. Women working in these places were usually protected by bouncers, ensuring a level of safety for them. On the other hand, street-based sex workers faced greater risks as they had to navigate the dangers of the Wild West on their own. However, even as some women aged out of traditional desirability, they could find refuge in small houses and continue working for the same madams who had employed them previously. Now they've changed their tune, call me Katie. Number 5. They had to face the toll of venereal disease. Despite its image of adventure and rugged individualism, the Old West also harbored a dark and dangerous side venereal disease. Sexually transmitted diseases such as syphilis and gonorrhea were pervasive among the population, posing significant health risks and limited treatment options. Prostitutes known as soiled doves or saloon girls faced a constant threat of disease. Syphilis aptly named the calamity due to the poor prospects for a cure and gonorrhea were especially prevalent among them. Unfortunately, effective treatments were non-existent as penicillin had not yet been invented. Instead, dangerous substances like calomel, a mercury-based powder, were used for treatment. However, these remedies caused severe side effects and caused patients to salivate, perspire, feel dry, want to vomit, and purge their bowels, all symptoms of mercury poisoning. 
The consequences of STDs extended beyond the saloon girls. Men who contracted these infections could unknowingly pass them on to their wives or other women they engaged with. A tragic example occurred in 1907 when 19-year-old Anna Groves contracted venereal disease from a customer. The man callously refused to offer any assistance, prompting Anna to take matters into her own hands. In a fit of anger and desperation, she fired a shot at the man through a window of the saloon in Wyoming. Although the bullet missed its target, Anna's actions led to her arrest. Reported by Laramie's semi-weekly boomerang, the incident revealed Anna's poor health condition. Despite pleading guilty and expressing remorse for her actions, Anna was sentenced to two years in the state penitentiary. However, her plight did not go unnoticed, and after five months, she received a pardon due to her deteriorating health. Number 4. Shady Ladies Sometimes Faced Discrimination In the conservative and rigid societal landscape of the 19th century, the concept of sexuality was entangled with strict moral beliefs. As a result, women engaged in sex work, often referred to as shady ladies, were perceived as a threat to the moral fabric of society. Despite the stigma attached to their profession, sex work was sometimes one of the few viable options for women during this era. In cases of widowhood or other challenging circumstances, becoming a shady lady could be a means for these women to support themselves and their families. The price of their services ranged widely, from as little as $1 to as high as $50 for sexual experiences. Number 3. Dead Problem with Family Substance Abuse and Alcohol Struggles Life as a saloon girl in the Wild West was far from glamorous, as these women faced numerous challenges that impacted their physical and mental well-being. Being far away from their families and friends, the sense of loneliness and unhappiness often led many saloon girls to turn to alcohol and drugs as a coping mechanism. The prevalence of mental depression among prostitutes was alarmingly high, pushing them towards seeking solace in substances. Easy access to alcohol and drugs within the saloons made it even easier for them to fall into the trap of addiction. Tragically, the holiday season, especially Christmas, proved to be an especially challenging time for these women, leading to an increase in suicides. Some saloon owners and madams encouraged addiction among their employees as a means of exerting control over them. This darker aspect of the trade exploited the vulnerabilities of these women, making it difficult for them to break free from their situation. Notable figures from the Old West like Calamity Jane lived troubled lives due to their addiction issues. Jane's rambunctious lifestyle, often fueled by alcohol, gained attention from newspapers and later historians. Another working girl, Celia Ann Maddie Blaylock, faced a downward spiral into addiction after her relationship with the famous gunfighter Wyatt Earp fell apart. Earp left Maddie when her addiction to laudanum, a painkiller containing opium, intensified due to her chronic migraines. Heartbroken and unable to find a way out, Maddie tragically returned to selling sex and committed suicide. And this freckle face is Ruth. And that right there is Clementine. Number 2. Cutthroat Competition and Rivalries Among Saloon Girls There was intense competition between women in Old West saloons and dance halls, often leading to violent disputes. Money, possession, and the attention of men were all sources of contention, driving some women to fight, beat, and even kill each other. The lack of stable and supportive friendships within the industry further fueled animosity and jealousy among the saloon girls. Author Carol Lee Bowers highlighted the cutthroat nature of the profession in Laramie, Wyoming, where hostility and suspicion were rampant, undermining the possibility of forming genuine and lasting friendships. Women in this line of work had limited opportunities to connect with individuals outside their profession, making even friendships with fellow saloon girls tenuous at times. Notorious rivalries among soiled doves became the stuff of legends, with some disputes turning violent. In El Paso, Texas, Madam Etta Clark and Big Alice Abbott engaged in a brutal confrontation when one of Alice's girls decided to work for Etta instead. The clash between the two madams ended in gunfire, leaving Alice wounded. However, newspapers misreported the incident, claiming she was shot in the public arch instead of the correct terms, pubic arch. In Leadville, Colorado, Madams Molly May and Sally Purple were fierce rivals, residing next door to each other. Their rivalry escalated to a gunfight which was later dubbed the Battle of the Painted Ladies by authors Vardy Fisher and Opal Laurel Holmes. Even renowned Denver Madam Maddie Silks found herself embroiled in conflict, 
engaging in a public brawl with fellow prostitute Katie Fulton along the South Platte River. The spectacle attracted a large crowd, becoming a dramatic display of the fierce competition among saloon girls. Number one, freedom was at a high cost for them. While saloon girls in the Wild West might have appeared to lead a free-spirited life, they were far from exempt from rules and regulations set by their employers and the authorities. Money was at the heart of the profession, and success or failure depended on their ability to attract and entertain customers. In places like the Klondike and numerous other frontier locales, dancehall girls had a specific task – to encourage their customers to drink. For every dollar spent on drinks, the girls received an ivory disc or metal token which they collected throughout the night. This unique form of compensation, often tucked into their stockings, ensured they earned a share of the profits. According to Moondance, dances usually cost between 75 cents and a dollar, and the girls typically split their earnings with the establishment's owner. For prostitutes, the financial arrangements varied. Some split their earnings with the madam who provided them with room and board, others paid daily, weekly, or monthly rent to the madam. Some saloon girls chose to live elsewhere and only rented rooms in the brothel for a night, while some lived in the brothels full-time. Regardless of their job description, saloon girls were subject to regular fines and license fees that went into the city's coffers. Cities like St. Louis, Missouri implemented social evil ordinances that required permits for all saloon girls. Additionally, prostitutes were allowed to work only if they possessed a clean bill of health issued by a city physician. Yet another expense they had to bear. These bastards leave a trail of bloodshed wherever they go. They hide their lies behind guns and tough talk. They tried to break us. We're glad you're joining us on this secret journey through the hidden lives of Wild West saloon girls. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell for more untold tales from history.